Good morning. This is Robin Bremer, and you're watching Walks with God. And today we're continuing our series on putting on the whole armor of God. Um, we're sharing from my book, Feed My People Joy, Kingdom Living for End Times. And today we are going to go over the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Um, <clears throat> according to Romans 10, 9, <clears throat> salvation is obtained by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and you believe he's been raised from the dead. Okay, and salvation means that you are now um, no longer under the God of this world, which is Satan, which we've gone over in um, before this. If you watch the whole armor of God, you'll understand that a little bit better. But you are now born again into the kingdom of God. God is your God. And your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. And um, you are saved. And you also, uh, Romans 3 says that all have sinned. Romans 6, uh, 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. Romans 10 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved, if you look up saved, it means, let me see the, it means to save, to deliver, keep safe, protect, heal, preserve, do well, and make whole. And it, what it means is you now are under the kingdom of God and you are a child of God. You are saved um, and you're not going to hell when you die. You are going to go to heaven. So the helmet of salvation is about um, on your put on your head. And the reason it's on your head is because of thoughts. Um, you do battle in your head about thoughts, about not believing you're healed, delivered, set free, and so on. The devil, the warfare is in our mind and in our thoughts. So first of all, you have to know that you're saved, and then everything else comes after that. And you're saved not by good works, not something you earned or something you did. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And grace is something you didn't earn. Grace is a free gift. So you don't go to heaven because, <clears throat> excuse me, because you've done good things or you're a good person. You, because the Word of God says, uh, because we were born after Adam sinned, then all of us were born sinners. No matter how good we are, we are born sinners because... Um, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so therefore they experienced evil. They became um, underneath. Satan became their father instead of God, and they were born in sin. So everybody after them was a sinner. And you're a sinner not because you sin. You're a sinner because you were born um, a sinner through Adam, through death. One, one man's sin, death reigned in this whole earth. You were born into death. And sinners, what they do is sin. Okay, they're not a sinner because they sin. They sin because they're a sinner. Uh, and they were born a sinner. Okay, um, and then when you receive the free gift of Jesus, when you call upon the name of Jesus, you receive the blood sacrifice he did and what he paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future, and you become born again. And you become righteous. And there's nothing... <clears throat> Jesus' blood is good enough to take care of every sin that you do. The blood of Jesus, once you accept Jesus, he's the only mediator between God and men. Once you accept that, you become righteous, okay? And you are saved, okay? Um, so, you're saved not because of what you did, but because of what he did. And um, he saved the whole person. When Jesus came, he took care of the whole person, body, soul, spirit, everything, finances, every part of your body, every part of your life. God now, because you became his child in his kingdom, uh, you have abundance in all areas of your life. You might not know it yet and walk in it yet, but the provision is there. It's given to you, and by the knowledge, you'll begin to walk in it. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says, Because they did not receive the love of truth, that they might not that they might be saved. So the people that have do not ask Jesus to be the Lord of their life, that did not receive the free gift, that do not call on the name of Jesus, um, they don't have a love of the truth and they aren't saved. So when you have some a loved one that's not saved, uh, you can uh, pull down the strongholds uh, of, um, of deception, religion, and tradition, and anything that's keeping them and hindering them from accepting the love of the truth. And just pray, Father, give them a love of the truth that they can be saved. Okay, and that's just touching on the helmet of salvation. Um, there's a lot more that... We can go over, but in this chapter, I choose not to. Let's go on to the Sword of the Spirit. The Sword of the Spirit is the last piece of armor. 
and the sword of the spirit is actually praying in tongues and praying the word because actually it's the word of God whether it's praying it in the heavenly language or saying it in English or whatever language you speak ah, I've got bugs crawling up my legs okay so right here in Ephesians 6 it says the sword of the spirit which is the word of God okay it's not just the word of God but it's the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit so the word of God is the sword of the spirit but if you keep the sword in in the belt all the time it doesn't do you any good you have to take the belt you have to take the sword out of the belt and use it in other words um, the word says that Jesus will come and he will devour those with a sharp sword that comes out of his mouth and says the word of God is a sword piercing and dividing the the flesh and the spirit realm the soul and the flesh so this, the Word of God deals with the physical world and the spiritual world and it is spiritual and the Word of God is what changes everything and it's your weapon when Jesus was on uh, tempted by the devil he used the sword of the Spirit he says it is written and that's what he fought the devil with the word because it's a sword okay but you have to speak it Jesus didn't just think uh, it is written he said it the sword has to come out of your mouth uh, the sword uh, is also praying in the spirit and that's in tongues that is a language other than your own it could be your heavenly language if you're uh, Chinese it could be Indian language whatever comes out uh, depending on okay stop it bug in Jesus name whatever um, language that you speak in your heavenly language is the sword of the spirit and sometimes when you're praying your language changes and it could become uh, sounding like something else. I know sometimes I pray in, in the spirit and it sounds like I'm talking in Indian. And so that's really cool. Anyway, praying in tongues is a weapon and I have a whole chapter on the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues in my book. Um, now the belt of truth is the word of God, knowing it, putting it in your heart. But the sword of the spirit is speaking, 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 speaking. So important is speaking God's word. Okay. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. you got to speak the word. And I have a whole chapter, uh, I think I've already done, on words. But it's also praying in tongues, which is one of the most fought after, the most fought about things in the Bible. The devil is fought that because tongues is a weapon and it's so, so important. Um, let's see. Okay, Isaiah 49, 2. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. And Hebrews 1, 3, upholding all things by the word of his power. So God's power is in his word. He's not a man that he should lie. Um, Psalms 103, the angels hearken to the voice of his word. So um, when you speak God's word, that's what puts the angels in operation. When the word says that he um, blesses us with the blessing, he makes us rich and adds no sorrow to it. That sends the angels out to go and to bring riches and wealth to us. They work for us when we speak God's language. They're sent to minister to us. That's Psalms 103, 20. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's Hebrews 4:20. Um, we're created in God's image, and everything that um, He created, everything by saying. He in Genesis 1, He said, He said, um, He said, blah blah blah. You know, like uh, let there be light, and there was light. He said whatever, and then there was what he said. And all the way through, he says it. Then he says, and he created, let's create man in our image. Well, the only image that we knew about God up to that point is God said this, and this happened. So we are created in his image. That's the image that he portrayed to us before he said those words. Um, Mark 11, 22 and 23.